Hey guys, so today you and I are going to talk about starting out and getting through interviews. So let's get into it. So the question in question was, let's see here. Hi Frederick, please help me out. What can I expect? From uh, what can I expect from my first junior front end React developer job? I'm currently in my last year at school and I am preparing to start applying for junior React roles so starting from the 1st of January and finishing my uh, last credits slowly but surely. I've been practicing React and Next.js uh, with style components since the pandemic started and I feel I've gotten fairly proficient at it. I'm still rather insecure about it and something tells me that I should wait for my degree before applying but honestly I can't be I can't be asked just to wait around. I'm only taking 15 credits per semester. I'm at the point where I know re how React works, its hooks, intermediate, uh, intermediate, intermediate at CSS, routing, TypeScript, Redux, and Redux is the only thing I suck at right now. Oh, don't worry about that, dude. Uh, if I ask the vast majority of software developers to set up a Redux uh, pipeline, they won't know how to do it without checking the docs. My projects include mostly work. My product include mostly working with APIs to display and fetch data or work with headless CMSs to do apps and single SSG websites for close friends with businesses. I feel like those products are too simple to impress employers. Do you have any advice? Well, uh, I basically wrote back to the subscriber that I can't give a good answer on this comment in like... Uh, like it's it's such a big topic it's such a big thing to answer this thing uh, in even in this one video so I decided okay let's do this let's try something uh, so usually when I make a video uh, like a coding video you will see my my code terminal and stuff like that but I'm just gonna do one of these talkers uh, without setting up all the PowerPoint presentations and oh, and all this uh, well it's Google stuff that I usually use uh, and then I'm gonna make sure that I do this at the the worst possible time because I've slept for three hours and it's a quarter, like it's like three o'clock in the morning now. But uh, if we just ignore all of that, I will do you a solid one and I will give you a video where I go through with you what I believe to be all the relevant things that you should be able to answer as a front end developer. And this is all going to be based on literally all the interview questions that I ask hundreds of candidates at this point uh, from previous jobs or my current job etc etc these are the questions that you that if you come and you want a job from me you will get them you you will get these sorts of questions and it's not just for me most of the time it's going to be the sort of questions that practically anybody will who is so who's doing this sort of work will expect you to have a ba ba at least a basic understanding. Does that sound nice? And please, do not under any circumstances, if you watch this, tell anybody that I'm doing this. Because I don't want people to watch this unless they're already a fairly solid subscriber who knows the knows what I'm trying to achieve here uh, because I'm so gosh darn tired of having all these uh, toxic people who seem to believe, who I'm very sorry to say, seem to believe that if you just learn the absolute basics about front end then you're set. And these are also the same sort of people who get into the interviews with me and my coworkers and they choke so bad. And I even got a stalker from it the, uh, the other um, not that long ago. He, I, he couldn't answer even basic questions about HTTP and like what were the basic methods and uh, this dude had been working for 12 years so he couldn't hire him so now he's spamming me on LinkedIn and stuff like that yeah, yeah, yeah it's a whole thing anywho so let's get into it uh, I'll start by saying that in terms of what you can expect at the technical level you can almost always expect you uh, to get a question regarding like a coding interview or something like that uh, and a code test that these are the two things that are practically practically 
basically standard practice in every serious IT company. The code test usually comes before the technical interview, but it can vary. And the code test usually is going to be something like building an application or something similar. Like the, some, the stuff that you have been describing that, oh, this is the stuff that I've been doing. That's actually the sort of thing that one of the scenarios actually favors, which I like to call the organic code test, where it's a code test that actually reflects reality. And for the vast majority of front-end developers working in React, they are going to be asked to build some simple, like a carousel or like a widget or a small web page or something like that. And usually they're going to be request, going to request that they showcase that they know how to work with APIs and things like that, right? Then you have the other one, which is more traditional, which is the computer science type where they basically just give you die-hard algorithmic problems like uh, solve, the M uh, solve an MP hard problem where like the knapsack problem or they're gonna ask you to, 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 to uh, traverse a graph or roll dices or something that you would expect from these platforms like Caddis and Lead Code and stuff like that. And there's no way for you to know which one you're gonna get. You should, in my experience, 50-50 uh, uh, if you can't know. But the thing that is always going to be true is the coding interview. So let's get into it. I'm going to give you some of the same questions like from various, like I've just made a collection based on the things that I've done in the past. Uh, and it doesn't, I am actually not so concerned even for like current employment purposes and so forth uh, to share this with you because the beautiful part about being interviewed by a software developer is that, uh, and depending on how you actually structure the interview, it doesn't matter if you know what I'm going to ask you before we do it, because you're not going to be able to answer the question to my satisfaction if you don't know your stuff. Even if you get to practice ahead of time, I will be able to tell how well you know it. Uh, so there's no way of cheating here. That's the beautiful part, and that's also why I argue that any successful IT company who wants to scale needs at least one senior software developer who really knows their stuff uh, who can ask these sorts of questions because what is it they say game recognizes game if you are a hr person or something like that you should not be interviewing uh, or have any say whatsoever basically apart from at the personality level what a software develop what type of the software developer you get mm. so uh, let's start I will, we will pretend like i'm doing one of my interviews so first and foremost, I want you to know uh, that I'm very happy that you join us. And the the thing that we like to do at the company FUBAR is that uh, we like to have a kind of organic conversation with our candidates where we have some technical questions that are very open-ended, like there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, and all we're really looking for is for you to kind of explain your knowledge on this topic. And then we'll have a discussion about that topic and see how much have you been working with it. If you haven't been working with it, that's perfectly fine. Nobody expects anybody to know all the things. Uh, and I'm dead serious when I say like I, the, like I haven't been able to answer all of the questions that people have asked me about IT. It's more about figuring out, okay, what level are you in at this specific thing and that sort of stuff, right? So let's start with the first one. How do you make your website accessible? Have you worked any? Uh, have you done any type of work with accessibility on the web? Now, for you guys, uh, I'll drop character here for a moment. This is it's extremely rare to find somebody who has done this in a serious fashion. Everybody says that either they have not, or they try to pretend like they have, when in reality they haven't. So when I ask this question, what I'm looking for is not for you to answer and say something like to lie to my face or try to pretend that you've done more than you have. What I'm asking is that you know the basics of things such as the area standard or th that you understand that color contrasts on the web matter or that you understand that there are some people who are browsing the internet with a screen reader. What is a screen reader? These sorts of things and that ties into, okay, does, do you start to understand now why HTML is actually more than something you see? It's actually something that has semantic meaning. So that brings us to structured and semantic HTML. Like, do you understand what that is? Do you understand why you should not use a div for everything and like these sorts of things? These are things that will be, it's for the vast majority of companies, they don't really care about this stuff, unfortunately, but there are some that do, especially the larger corporations, they care about this stuff. 
So a good answer there is to have an understanding of these sorts of concepts. Not you, you can you can spend an afternoon or like a weekend learning about this stuff, and you will have enough information to say things that are relevant. And this is the beautiful part. Even if you were to come to me today and try to, if you have done your homework on this, you will not have the experience to do this, because just because you studied it, that doesn't mean that I that doesn't mean that you know have an in-depth understanding of it. And that's why the sort of that's why I keep on telling people, guys, do not try to get into IT by simply learning, buying all the algorithm books. It's not going to work. You have to practice. You have to get an understanding and experience and learning by doing to get really good at this stuff. And I don't care who tells you that if you just read their book or if you take this algorithm course and focus really harsh hard on that you're going to get into Google yeah sure you might be able to pass their coding test but if you get to the interviewing stage with someone who knows some stuff they're going to eat you alive that's why I tell people that you cannot scam your way in to IT it's not possible unless you have an interview who is completely incompetent so another question I would like to ask you, do you know what a CDN is? What does CDN stand for? And uh, some people know that, some people don't. Um, let's see if I remember the abbreviation stands for Content Distribution Network, if I remember correctly. And the basic idea, and that we asked the candidates to explain a little bit, like uh, what does this mean? Well, the basic idea is that it is a network of usually servers that are primarily focusing on static file uploads. So what the idea is that if we have a bunch of images or CSS files and stuff like that, and of course you can use CDNs for much more than this, it's just a basic explanation. Uh, the basic idea is that if you are in Sweden and you want to get my images, uh, uh, you should be able to get those images from a server that is very close to Sweden so that even if I host my website in the US I don't have to go and get the images from the US that's the basics so you pay a company such as say Akamai or something like that to host a bunch of service across the world and then they route based on your usually your IP or, IP or your location to a server that is closer than the one that you might be using. And that means that we're, our websites are going to load faster. That is the basics. There's more to it than that, but that's the basics. And then we might ask about, well, let's talk about lazy loading. Lazy loading, how do you feel about that? Do you, can you explain to me what lazy loading a script means and lazy loading images and like bundle splitting, things like that? And this is also a very good area for you to know about because it's extremely important for you to be an effective front-end developer to know about this stuff. Uh, and it also shows an in-depth understanding of concepts that goes beyond that you know how to use parcel. You know how to, you know, well, usually people don't, don't even know how to use Webpack, they say they do. And then you ask them a very simple question and they have no idea. Uh, usually like they, they don't know what lazy, they, they sort of know what the concept is, but they don't actually know how to do this without this tool that does it for them. And then they're, they're practically, it's, they're not useless, but they're not an experienced developer because the lazy loading is a much bigger concept than, you know, that Next.js does a bit of that for you. So lazy loading a script in essence, guys, it means that you have some data, an asset, some JavaScript or an image or something like that. And for whatever reason, you do not need to get that information as soon as the page loads. So what a concept that we like to use in web design is what we call above fold. Now, above fold basically means that it's the top part that you see of the web page. So as you can imagine, if you have, say, a bunch of really big images, very beautiful images for your website, it doesn't make any sense for you to load them until the user actually gets to look at them because it might be that they're just loading the website and then they bounce immediately instead of scrolling down and looking at them. So that's where you can use things like, like the loading attribute, which is fairly new, or you can use an intersection observer. That's also sort of new in my day when we started doing it, we would use custom attributes. So you would have like a low resolution image, like a, or even a data attribute, a data, a, like an, a base64 data field or whatever it's called, uh, which is just, just a static color. And then you set the dimensions of the images that you're 
that you want and then you use some JavaScript where you look at either the scroll event, don't do that unless you're debouncing, that's very important because that's a performance problem. Uh, and then when the user gets close enough, if, even if you don't have an insert intersection observer, uh, you t grab the the URL from the data, the custom data attribute on your image or whatever you put, wherever you put it, uh, and inject it into the source attribute, and then it's actually go, and then the browser is going to load the image, and that way you don't load the image until it's necessary. And the same thing is for scripts. If a uh, classic one that practically everybody who even the juniors have a decent understanding of is that the uh, if you have say a SPA like react and a react app or something like that if you're using react router if you have five six routes on your main website there's no reason for you to load all of that JavaScript immediately it's better for you to just load the stuff that is going to be visible on the first page and then chunk or like use like uh, use bun uh, use your bundler to split out the other bits that you uh, have for the different routes and then when the user tries to click on one of those then you might load it or you might load it when the whole page is like in a ready state or something like that there's many ways many strategies to deal with lazy loading but these are the basics and then they might ask you, like, because that's that's the guy, guy thing, guys. I'm just going to give you the things that I, off the top of my head, that I've asked many, many, many times. And it's usually these the questions that I'm asking right now. Depending on how you answer them, I'm going to be able to fairly accurately tell what skill level you are, based on that. So these are things that you should know about or look into if you want to be good and fairly solid in answering questions in uh, like a generic made up interview with myself at the very least and I think that should be good enough for most uh, most companies uh, and then I might ask you what is a bundler and why do we use a bundler can you name a bundler or something like that and for the most part I will be happy with any bundler that you can mention webpack is probably the most famous one which practically everybody knows about uh, the thing that people usually get wrong and that is also what I mean guys when I say that people usually get this wrong I don't mean that like someone who's fresh out of college gets this wrong I have talked to senior software developers with 20 years of experience who don't know these things and that's why we have all that that's why we do quality control at, over at all in in, in uh, software engineering because it's sim simply put if you've been working at a small time agency working primarily with things like wordpress or whatever it might be then you don't know this stuff but for my more sophisticated project, or that's that's different levels, right? Because that if you're going to work at I don't know Google, or if you're going to work at one of the bigger IT companies, they don't do those basic things exclusively. They require more from their software developers. So knowing about what a bundler does is a fairly important thing. The basic idea is that it used to be the case, and you probably know this if you know the basics about JavaScript. The browser is going to load the scripts in sequence. You can change that behavior a little bit, but in essence, every script that you have, every script that you inject is assuming that the next script is going to be loaded afterwards. In other words, if you have script one and two, if you switch, if you depend on something in script two, that script one has, then it's really important that script one comes first because otherwise it's going to break. Because if you haven't done that, well, then script two is now depending on something that isn't on the page. So you get, you have to, that's used to be the case, you have to make sure, make sure that you have everything in just the right order. That's a very big problem because it's really hard for a human to keep track of a really large JavaScript uh, code base and make sure that you know how to import everything just in the right order. Now, this is the basics of what Webpack does. And many people get this whole thing wrong that, oh, Webpack, well, Webpack is transpiling the code and doing all this other stuff. No, 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 no. That's what the loader does. At its core, all that Webpack does is to allow you to use imports or like uh, use the uh, ES module system or common JS or I mean you can use UMD or you can use AMD like there are many module systems but in essence what it does is that it allows you to take all of those files tell 
your file system or your editor that yeah import that file there import that file there import that file there and you have maybe a hundred or maybe a thousand files ain't no way no way you're gonna be able to manually figure out how to load all those things into a page you don't want that to, to begin with unless you use HTTP2 maybe so what Webpack is going to do is it's going to traverse that file system, pull in all those modules and create a dependency graph and pull it all together into a very nice big bundle. And that bundle is now one single JS file where everything loads in the right order so that you don't have to think about that yourself. These, I'm, very, I'm broad stroking a lot here now because Webpack can do so many things, but that is the essence of the value that a bundler brings to the table. All this other stuff with Babel and like transpiling to like more like with the new features in the ECMA standard, etc., etc., that's secondary. It's very nice, it's very great, it's awesome, but the basics of it all is just dependency, uh, creating a dependency graph. That's what it does. So uh, then I will ask you a hygiene question, such as say, can you explain to me what a promise is? And what is the relationship between a promise and say async await? Now, when I ask this question, it's actually funny because the standard standard answer I get is that, well, a promise is, some, is, that, is that thing that I get when I do a network request. Yeah, it's something related to networks, right? No, it's not. Well, it's the, it's it is. You're absolutely right. Like the person who's saying, like the candidate who usually says this, is completely correct. It is a, it, it is something that has to do with the network, but it's not exclusive to the network because you can do new promise and actually instantiate a promise wherever you please. It's just that if you say fetch, that's the thing that you're going to get back. And async await, uh, many people do know this because it's fairly recent, like it's getting to the point where most tutorials include it in some way, where async await is just a way, it's syntactic sugar basically that allows you to, instead of doing promise.then.then.then.then, to write code in a at least visually synchronous fashion. You can say oh, async on a function and then say await. And instead of having to chain all those then, call, uh, then calls, you simply say await instead. But that's that's the, that's the basic, we can go much deeper than that. And I mean, if you want me to go, uh, that's actually funny because I was I was told that when I was interviewing for one of my uh, positions I had not that long ago, uh, I have this thing and a lot of candidates do when they interview, where I always find it hard to figure out, okay, what depth do you want me to answer? Like to what depth do you want the answer? And so I started saying that, well, basically, these are the basics of a promise. Do you want me to go into category theory and the fact that, say, a promise is actually a monad and what a monad is or like things like that? And the interview was like, oh, shit, they didn't even know that because it's not relevant for most developers. It's just that because I love functional programming and I love JavaScript, I kind of picked that up along the way. But it's not something that you know, nobody's going to expect you to know a promise to that level and go to that level of theory. Uh, it's a nice little trick you can use if you want to impress some people, but then again, uh, it, there are more th important things to focus on. And then you might get asked things such, uh, let's talk about, say, TypeScript. Are you using TypeScript? Now, you don't have to use TypeScript. I promise you that you don't have to, but it's a very good thing if you do, and TypeScript is very quickly becoming the industry standard for front-end developers. Uh, if if you're not if your company isn't using TypeScript, it's probably thinking about using TypeScript. If it's not thinking about using TypeScript, you're probably using working for a small-time agency or consultancy firm. F serious IT projects are all most of the time migrating over to TypeScript, so having exposure to TypeScript is a very good, strong thing. And if you can reason about it, talk about pros and cons, that's a very good thing. I don't want to get into that in this video because it's basically, this is like super personal experiences. And as I was saying, there is no way for you to trick anybody. But if you listen to what I've been saying so far, even if you were to go and study this stuff now, you're not going to be able to convince me that you know this stuff by heart. I don't even have a, sp like I, I'm literally just reading the questions right now. And that's because I've like done this stuff a hundred times before, so I don't have to like I, I don't I don't have to have like a a cheat sheet here next to me on my screen because I know it like 
for real. That, if that makes sense. I'm not an expert or anything. I'm not claiming to like know all of it. I'm just saying that it's not possible for you to fake this. Uh, let's see here. Uh, do, 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 do. One that my coworker liked to ask me, which I thought was really nasty of him, was, can you tell me what the difference is between the defer and a sync attribute on a script tag? And this is one of those examples when I got it wrong, when I was doing it, like I, because it's not something that I think, because I'm old school in this regard, because like I never thought about why would I need the defer keyword and why would I need the async keyword? I will just add my script tags at the end of the body tag. Or like at the very least at the end of the document so that I don't, so it's, it's the last thing that happens. Because I know that the script tag is going to invoke a, call, a network call when it's hit. Which means that if you have a really big JavaScript file, you do not want to put that in the head. Because that's going to be very heavy and it's going to block everything else from happening until that thing is done. The only time you want to do something like that is if you have a metrics gathering script or something like that, like say Google Tag Manager or Google Analytics or something like that. And it's really, really important for some reason that this specific script is on the page done before all the other nodes are parsed and like before the DOM tree is, is finished, right? But otherwise, I never do did this sort of stuff. So, async, which was the one that I, that's the one I actually got right in the last time somebody asked me this. The basic ex explanation you can go and look this up on MDN if you want is that if you put async on a script, it says basically you're telling the browser that you can load this script whenever. Just put that on a separate thread, a separate uh, like a, a separate worker, and whenever it's done it's done just load the script that's it it's completely async quote unquote defer is a little bit different so defer basically says that it's similar if you you can put a script tag anywhere in the page and when the browser hits that and says oh that's a defer thing okay what do i do well what it's going to do is that it's going to wait until the document is in the ready state in other words it would be sort of, if I'm not saying something wrong now, uh, if I am, please go and look this up. Uh, it's going to be the equivalent of having the script tag at the bottom of the page. That's in essence what you're saying. Because when you get to the end of the page, you are now quote unquote finished with loading all the things. Not completely, that's not 100% accurate. It's more technical than that, but that's the gist of it. So you can put the script tag in the head, say defer, and you don't have to worry that it's gonna block the whole page. Right, let's talk about React then, React specific questions. So can you tell me a little bit about the pros and the cons between functional components and class components and maybe do you, if you have any hooks that you are familiar with or things like that. Now this is a standard like basically if you can't answer this question you don't know anything about React type of thing. Uh, hooks and functional components versus class components is like it's day one stuff it's stuff that you learn be, uh, very early on and most of the time the interviewers are going to be very happy if you just say things like yeah i use use effect which is like the most common hook or use state which is also the most common hook in the world if you can leave if you're fancy and you use you have like memo if you know about memoization and use memoize that's very good uh, I think I still haven't used uh, the uh, more, the more, like some of the more advanced ones. I haven't really like I can't remember. Is it use action? Yeah, I can't remember the API now. But I still haven't found a use case for it in my own work. So I use like I mean I get by on practically everything I want to do with uh, use with use effect and use state, and that's the case for most of the people who are working on React. And as for comparing functional components to class components, I'm an old fart and I really liked the class components because it was a very clean, consistent interface, but the community is moving towards the functional approach. And the reason they're doing that is because of the hook system, because it's a bit cleaner for people, they think, to use hooks to move shared logic and, re and get reusability from multiple components. Uh, between, like between, like I mean, if you have use history, which is a very co common hook, or something like that, you might want to create a hook that you can just import as a module, because that's basically what it becomes a module in 
multiple components. And doing that is a lot easier than writing out all the boilerplate for every single class component you want to make. And as for using one over the other, it's actually really hard, I think. Uh, I can't really find a good reason these days to not use a functional component. There are some very niche situations where you might be able to do it, but I don't, I, on, I'm going to be completely honest, I'm not at the uh, proficiency level with like these in all these interfaces to know if I'm going to be completely right. Because like when we talk about mounting, unmounting, having resource cleanup and all this stuff, the thing that I need to actually, it's funny that I say this now because I need to look this up and be, be get better at that myself, is how, because what's very nice about the, fun, I think about the class component is that it, it, you know the exact life cycle of all the things. In other words, you have you have these life cycle methods. Now you have that through the hook system as well. But the thing that I find so annoying sometimes when I see people write uh, React code is when they inline all their functions. Now you have to correct me because the thing that I was taught uh, way back when was that if you have a lambda function or a, like a closure or something like that in a loop, what you're basically doing is that you are, re you are recreating that function every single time you run through the loop. So if you say, if you say const equal foobar something something that does something, and you loop a hundred times, you will force the V8 engine or whatever you're using to create that function a hundred times. That's not very effective, and that's what a class is there to do. Like it can you instantiate that thing once, and then even if you're looping, you're still using the same reference. Now with a functional component you have hooks and what I see a lot of people doing is that they will declare inline functions on top of those hooks and that's the thing that I'm a little bit unsure about like what the performance effects of that is if you're actually recreating those functions or if React is clever enough to actually figure out that yeah you know what uh, this thing is re-rendering but it's exactly the same function so I don't have to recreate it not sure about that you're gonna have to look that up on your own uh, and then people might ask you something about, well, let's talk about uh, Redux. So could you tell me about the context API, Redux, and the state hook? Can you tell me a little bit about your experience level with this and how these things kind of, how they fu function together and when do you use one over the other? Once again, as you can hear, uh, this is not something that you can fake. It's, it's raw experience. Uh, to be able to answer this in an effective way. So this is just my answer to the thing. So what I like to say is that if you're going to use the context API or Redux, because they basically have the same use case, there are a few nuances that you might appreciate with one over the other. One strong benefit for the context API is that it's just, it's like in React immediately. And the, like you don't have to add any extra library like Redux. A uh, strong case for Redux is that it's a pipeline system, like the way it's structured, and together with a very nice uh, browser uh, extension that gives you a good overview of the events that are going through, like when you're doing actions and stuff like that, you can actually get a, it's basically event sourcing. That is basically what it is. Uh, you get a very nice log of all the things that are happening. Uh, so for some people, they prefer Redux. Mostly, I would say, because the context API didn't used to be so nice. But you can still use Redux for a valid purpose. But at the end of the day, they're doing sort of the same thing. And the uh, state. So when do you use, use the state hook versus something like Redux or the context API? Well, uh, usually, depending on your philosophy, the good answer here is going to be that if I have something that is internal to my component, I want to use the state. If I have something that needs to be shared across multiple components, then I want to use Redux or the context API. Because yeah, although I can use the state for everything, it's going to lead to what we call prop drilling, where you basically have this value at the top of the tree, and then you have to pass that through all the child components until it reaches the component that needs it apart from the, the top node. That's not very effective and it's like it, there's a lot of boilerplate that goes into that and that's kind of the whole point of the context where you can circumvent that whole thing and just inject it. It's basically dependency injection. 
uh, but what you don't want, which is the reverse, that is to put everything on the state. The reason why you don't want to do that is because the state is being passed through, especially like if you did do Redux, this might be a problem for you. You're basically populating all the data into all of the children of the tree. Like so, whenever that big thing changes, like that big data structure, well, then you're going to pass it through. It's like having a massive, uh, a, like a heavy image or something like that, where you, you, if if you, if it's too big, it's actually going to affect performance. And I've been here. I've been here where I've worked on applications where people loaded a search page of queries to the system without any pagination, and as you can imagine, that was not. That didn't end all that well. It worked well in the beginning when we had like a hundred query hits. When we had a thousand, and they were all on the Redux state master, like the the Redux state, the page became very sluggish, because you're basically passing through all of that information to all of the components. It's not that's a recipe for disaster. Uh, they might also ask, can you explain in your own terms the virtual DOM? What's that about? And so this is the thing that made Re Re React famous to begin with, and there are many write-ups on the virtual DOM, so I'll just give you the basic idea. So the virtual DOM's basic idea is that you maintain a copy of the DOM tree that you see in front of the page. And then what React will do is that when there's a state update to the DOM, when like a user is interacting or changing something and so forth, it will traverse the virtual copy that it has diff the changes and apply, it, um, apply these changes. That way you can just, you basically re-render the section that got updated in a very, very naive and like super gen, uh, like simplified uh, explanation. You can think of it as having a git diff. It's going to compare the two trees, its own virtual DOM with the real DOM and say, hey, there's a difference here, apply those so that the user can see those differences. And that is a very clever way, I think at the very least, of solving the whole re-rendering problem, which is a hassle to deal with if you don't have something like React or like, I mean, that's what basically what all these SPA frameworks are helping us with. Let's talk about CSS. Can you tell me of any CSS architectures or systems that you've been using and how, what do you like about one versus the other? Now what the interviewer is looking for here is what level of experience do you have with things like BIM, SMAX, object-oriented CSS, CSS in JS, CSS modules, LESS, SCSS, SAS, uh, PostCSS, what else is there? And then of course the frameworks, Tailwind, uh, Material UI, Bootstrap, uh, Foundation, what more is there? Yeah, there's probably more. Uh, they, that's basically what they're looking for. CSS modules, did I say that one? I can't remember now. Uh, they're, they're basically just trying to figure out, okay, your CSS experience, where is it? Is it that like you've only written global CSS in a single CSS file or do you actually know about these things? And there's not really a right or wrong answer here. It really comes down to, as I said, uh, experience. Mm. So I'm not going to dive into that all that much because I can stand here and I can tell you that my thoughts on, I don't know, BEM is this, my thoughts on uh, CSS in JS is this, etc, etc. It's really just a conversation here where you get to kind of stretch your muscles and show off. Uh, and then if they're, they might ask you about media qu queries. Can you explain to me what a media query is? What is, it per what is its purpose? Why do we use it? Etc. Etc. And this is the one. Like a, a lot of. Like, I mean, I don't think I've asked a single candidate this question, and they haven't been able to at least sort of answer the thing. But it's really down to your comfort level here, and like how. So once again, as I was saying, guys, I can hear, and that can all the interviews are worth anything. Can hear based on how fast you reply and how secure you are in the information that you are relaying. There are two things happening. I am seeing how stable you are and I'm also seeing how well you know the topic and some I mean there's nothing right or wrong here it really comes down to the value system of the person doing the interviewing and you can be super nervous and still know the answer and you can be super secure and not to know the answer 
And they, these are the two blocks that I always, you know, if, you, uh, if you've watched my videos, you know that I always tell you software is about two things. It's about soft skills and it's about tech skills. And by doing this interview with me or whoever you're doing it with, I'm getting information on both of these things at the same time. So a media query is a, simply explained. It is a way for you to set up a set of rules for CSS saying that if this rule applies, and almost everybody thinks that it's all about the screen width, that it's not necess it's the normal use case. It's like what everybody uses it for, but it's not the only thing. There are other things such as accessibility. And even if uh, I, the only time I've actually really, if I'm honest here, used media queries for something more Diff like something different from screens and like just setting like a responsive layout is uh, for print. Uh, so you can actually say that your rule is not going to be applied just exclusively for like a screen width. It's when you try to print the page. So if somebody tries to, I don't know, so let's say, and I did this for a company actually, they had invoicing and that invoice was of course an HTML website. But when they wanted to print it, they didn't want to show all this unnecessary information that they saw in the browser. So you change the style sheet and you say print. And then when you open up, you, you right click and say, hey, print this page. It's actually going to look different. The styles will be different. So that's the basics of what a media query does. Uh, and then they might ask you, this is a factoid one. Uh, I have to this day only, only had this answer. Uh, this question answered by people we, we when we hired them they very quickly became the either the leaders of their team or the like uh, they were among the best that we have and that is can you explain to me what the box model is nobody knows this and it's not super important but it's you're gonna feel pretty I, I, I mean most people feel a little bit silly when I tell them. If you work in Chrome, which I assume if you're a decent software developer, you do. Uh, you, Firefox is okay as well. As long as it's not uh, not Safari, you're you're forgiven in my book. Uh, when you open your inspector and you check your dev tools, you know that little box that tells you, like what, where is like how much space do you have on the the margin, the padding, the border, stuff like that that's the box model. You may not know them, that's, that's what. That's the case, like if people know the box model, they just don't know the name and they don't, again, the juniors usually don't have, they haven't gotten to the point where they reflect about the whole web page layout, that everything's a box and things like that. So this is an area where you can impress a little bit if you know this stuff, because this is on one of those, I am an architect level type of software interviewer and I want to put you on the spot with my factoids uh, type of questions. If you can nail that, you're gonna blow their socks off. And then lastly, we'll talk about testing. How do you test your code? The only answer you can never give here is that you don't. And you have no idea how many times I've heard that one. Oh, I don't test my code. We don't really work with unit testing, etc., etc. Guys, front end engineering, although I, you and me, I'm not going to tell anybody, know that for the average small scale project where you're building a simple website or you're not doing something super advanced, nobody gives a shit about testing. Not even your boss is going to care about testing. But in the interviewing stage, they're going to ask you. It's the, it's the, da it's the same damn question they ask. Uh, uh, <laughs> are you a responsible driver? It's a bullshit question that everybody says yes to and it just wastes everybody's time. And if you're honest here and you say that you don't do any testing, then you are a fool. You don't understand, in my opinion, you're, or not a fool, you're too honest for your own good. Ideally, you should be doing testing, but I also know that if you're working at the low end of IT, com uh, IT uh, companies, there is almost no testing, even in the big companies. Like, I mean, I struggle to get my team to do testing. Everybody struggles in the front end space to do testing because nobody cares about it, which I think is one of the reasons why people don't take front end developers seriously. We have to step the game up. But the good answer here is if you say things like, well, I do unit testing, I use primarily Jest for that, if, you know, if we're talking React land now, and React testing library, or I mean, Enzyme is still sort of 
little bit relevant, but everything's moving to testing library right now, as far as I know. Uh, that's a very good thing. And then you can talk a little about a bit about snapshot testing, for example, that you do that sort of thing, and maybe you even impress them really and say that you do like integration tests type of things, or you might be doing end-to-end -end tests with things like Cypress or whatever you might be using. If you want to get up to the architect level and be really impressive in the space where, yeah, shit, this dude actually under or girl understands concepts that are relevant at a team lead level, then you might be mentioning things like gurking and BDD things and visual regression and stuff like that. Those levels of testing usually only the people who have done this for a while know about. It's very rare that juniors have any understanding of what that is and even the mid levels and seniors don't know that unless they, as I said, unless they are at the level where, well, if we hire you odds are that you know enough to actually train our staff. Just a little heads up. But once again, it doesn't matter if I tell you now, because if you start today to go and Google for all this stuff, you're still not going to know it well enough to be able to trick anybody into believing that you know this uh, stuff really well. You need, to, you need to walk the walk and get some experience with it before it's valuable to anybody. Otherwise, it's just like, a, it's like what the recruiters do, right? They say all the right things. But if you, if you know what they're saying, you know that they don't know the first thing about it. They just know the word. And then lastly, uh, I like to end with, and this is, pay attention now, because this is probably the most important question that you can possibly get, especially if you're a junior software developer. You have to get this one right. Otherwise, we're not going to hire you practically. Uh, no one is going to hire you. It's the, of all the things that I've said so far, these are all things that are based on experience. But there's almost always one question like this. How do you keep yourself updated? Is there anything in IT right now that you find extra interesting? Uh, like, is there something you're paying close attention to? Do you have any side projects or do you contribute to something? Or like, how? what's your level of interest? This is the most socially important question that you can answer. And I have seen many candidates, because usually the way it goes is that we evaluate every candidate, depending on company now. Uh, uh, if you, Let's assume now that you are applying to a really large IT company who are hiring both juniors and senior developers. If you're applying to a company where they're only interested in seniors, you're already dead in the water based on the other questions if you can't answer them. But let's assume now that it's down to You've kind of shown that you are either, because all if you've answered all the questions that I just asked you, I will know if you're a senior, a mid-level, or a or a junior developer. I promise you, I will know that. Uh, but what I don't know, based on what you've said, depending on how your social interactions w work and like how nervous you are, uh, things like that, I don't know if you're going to be a good investment. So if I'm unsure about your your tech skills at this point, this is the million-dollar question. Because if you tell me, and I've had people who've said this, well, I don't really have time, or yeah, no, I just do it at work, or yeah, no, I, I don't really, I, I, I follow a few people on Instagram. Pfft, guys, that's, that's a bad, that's a bad fucking answer. It's such a bad answer. Don't say that stuff. Anybody who knows anything about uh, IT will know that that's the answer that someone who isn't truly passionate about their profession is going to give. And if you say that, uh, and we're on the ed fence on uh, should we invest in you, should we not invest in you, you, you kind of just lost the game, most likely. Because when, especially when you're a junior, what a software company wants from a junior is, as I said, a good investment. And a good investment is an individual who has the potential to get good really quickly, or someone who can bring a lot of happiness and energy and positivity into the field, or, uh, or hunger, or things like that. And so if you answer and you say, well, I'm really into Next.js, or I'm really into React, or I'm super into GraphQL, or Rust, or something, you show that you have fire in your fucking eyes. You care about this stuff. If you do that, you will get the job. I promise you you're going to get the job. I guarantee it. And it does not matter if you're a junior, mid-level, or a senior developer. Unless you have proven, and I like to say that it's always down to one of these two things, either you are, ideally you should be both, 
like the, these are the these are the hiring and like firing scenarios. If you are both technically skilled and a good social strong strong character, we want you to run things at our company. That's usually how it goes. That's how you become a tech lead. If you are just really good technically, but you're not really hungry and you're not really all that passionate and so forth, then you're perfect for a senior level of role, and like I like, I like to call them engines, uh, either as a hire or a consultant or something like that. We're not going to make you most likely a leader if we, unless we really have to, because like, uh, uh, running a company is about more than just hard technical skills. And then on the other hand, if you're a little bit weak technically, but you have an amazing personality, a lot of hunger, a lot of energy and positivity, and you're curious and things like that, well, then we want to hire you because now you have potential. Sure, we're not going to pay you like a senior person who knows all the things, but we're going to be very interested. That much I can promise you. If you don't have any of these two things, you're never going to get the job. Ever. And I've seen, like, I've seen everything from... Uh, uh, you have uh, like the the best parts. Like uh, the uh, it wasn't all that long ago where uh, we offered I offered a job to a junior software developer who basically like ha she had very very weak technical skills. That didn't matter because she had an enormous. She literally sat during the meeting and she did. And you can do this as well. If you have the chance, because kind of think about it, if you're in an interview with a senior software developer and they're asking all these sorts of questions and you're not getting them right. That's going to be very stressful for you, but see if you can turn this into a learning experience. Because if you sit, if she sat there and she was writing down the answers that I was giving to her as I was kind of trying to explain my perspective on the things that she was saying, she showed a genuine interest. So we offered her a job. I don't know if she, uh, I don't know how, how it went there, but she was she, her personality won the game for her. And then the other time there was a senior software developer, and he was, I, I like to describe him as the worst case scenario. He is the, he was the thing that no one in IT can ever become, because if you become that person, uh, you are practically useless to the vast majority of the IT, apart from working as a consultant at the low end uh, companies. He had, he basically had the weakest tech skills that you can imagine. He had enough knowledge to do the job where he was working where they had a very specific stack doing only thing in, in a very specific way, but he had no knowledge of how the internet worked or like how any of the relevant stuff actually was done. And he had tons of years of experience. And his attitude towards his own personal development was, as I said, well, I don't really have time for that. Uh, I mean, I want to practice more, but I really don't. I describe him as, um, I like to say that, if you are a senior software developer and you're really good at what you do, you can afford the luxury of not being passionate because you have skills. He had the attitude of a senior software developer who's tired of trying hard without the skill. He was a junior in skill, but a senior in mind. And that is not going to work. So what I want you to take away from this is that uh, these are a few sample questions. Uh, that if you can answer these uh, uh, to the satisfaction of whoever's doing the interview, they will know that you have what it takes to work in their company practically, uh, assuming that you've passed the code test and all that stuff. Because the things that, uh, these are just, of course, I mean, there are a hundred other things that I could be asking you, but these are the things that I have asked a hundred times by now. And based on these questions and the answers that I have gotten, I can determine very quickly if, I'm going to hire you or not. So for you, if you're wondering as this person who is asking, like, what do I have to know? How do I get through the interview? Start with these sorts of questions. Learn the answers to these sorts of questions and learn it well. Because as I said, if your idea is that you're going to take my little video now and I'm going to, you're going to take this little list here, write that down and go, yeah, I'm just going to study this for the next week and then I'm going to be able to get into Google. You're kidding yourself. That's not going to work. You're going to have to study and practice fucking hard so you know this so well that when I ask you, you can stand here and bab for blab for 55 minutes. That's how long I've been standing here. And when you can do that without stopping and with a little bit of just Pepsi, I think, to sustain yourself, then you're ready. I promise you. Have a great day.